Thank you very much, Greg. Over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to introduce some key findings of our work on how cities are facilitating the green transformation. It's based uh, on a survey, a global survey, which we conducted at LSE Cities with my colleague, Graeme Floater, over the last 12 months, where we inquired about 90 cities about their transition efforts. It was done in partnership with ICLE and the Global Green Growth Institute and initially prepared for the Rio Plus 20 Summit and the Global Green Growth Forum in Copenhagen earlier this year. I'm going to focus on four key points that cut across uh, our findings. The first on policy sectors and where cities are making a difference. The second on pioneering and attitudes towards socio-technical transition in cities. Third, on collaboration and the importance for accelerating the green transition. And finally, placemaking, the role of spatial planning and infrastructure investments. Before a quick introduction to the survey, what we did here is surveyed the 90 cities I refer to. You see them here on the world map. It's covering quite a bit in terms of geography and cultural context. Uh, there we approached formally city governments to give us an official response to a questionnaire. And in addition, we went deep into nine, eight cities, the ones in capital letters, including London, Copenhagen, but also Durban, Belo Horizonte, and Hong Kong. And there we had in-depth interviews with key stakeholders from the business sector, from public officials, and coupled that to a data and policy analysis. To start with, a first perspective on how cities feel they have achieved progress to date. What you see here are a range of green policy objectives, and for each, the bar indicates how cities responded on a scale indicating categories from very successful to not successful at all. Anything in yellow is, broadly speaking, sort of a positive response. So we see here good progress on the provision of green space, on recycling, on water pollution, but the real big ones like greenhouse house gas emissions, uh, energy security, and reducing resource consumption are still sectors that need to be tackled. Over to my first point, and which are the sectors where cities are making a difference? And obviously, cities are responsible for a whole range of different sectors, very much dependent on the powers they are granted by other tiers of government. It's also increasingly acknowledged that cities are particularly good at cutting across these classic sectors, producing uh, cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral uh, policies, sectors here, where at least you have two, if not even three or four of these sectors. Nevertheless, if you ask cities about their progress, you still go back to those classic categories. And here the response, what, with regards to what are the sort of development levels for each of these categories. Waste comes first, land use second, water third. Look at food policy, which really doesn't seem to have a major role at an urban level. We also inquired about how these broader green policies relate to objectives of the city's economic growth, so the classic bringing together for fostering a green economy. And it's here where the three biggies, transport, energy, and buildings, feature first. Let me focus on the first two, because there's a dramatic difference between the two. Transport is a classic urban sector. This is where we have been celebrating cities, and each of these images, I don't even have to introduce them, you will know of them. These are stories that are well communicated, and in general, we know this is where cities have achieved a lot. If we move on to energy, it's an entirely different story. What you see here is the world's largest offshore wind farm. It's called the London Array. It will eventually produce electricity for 150,000 homes. But besides the name, it has actually nothing to do with London, and certainly not with London's government. If anything, it's an outcome of European-level and UK-level policy frameworks. Now, that can be very different in other cities. This is Munich, a city which owns its utility company a big utility company that not only has a large turnover but makes good profits. And these profits are spent strategically on targets like 100% renewable by 2025. Moving on to my second point, cities and attitudes towards socio-technical innovation. And the first thing I want to highlight here is that 
it's become a bit of a cliche how much cities are leading the green, or leading in general. But behind the, behind the cliche, as Ricky showed yesterday, are real numbers. It's a reality that cities are leading. It's a reality that they are pioneering. Look at these decoupling diagrams, which you also find in our newspaper. We then ask about the general attitude towards green innovation and investment. And it was surprising to see that only a quarter of cities are either extremely conservative or don't have a real attitude. About half, about half of the cities are innovative but constrained by budgets, and almost 30% regard themselves as highly innovative and even experimental. Looking at how new technologies uh, are featured across sectors and where cities stress the bringing in of technologies uh, as uh, really a key feature, it's again transport, energy, and buildings that come first. And zooming in and asking cities, okay, fair enough, but what's behind the technology in each of these sectors? What comes first? That is the answer. In transport, intelligent traffic management. In energy, it's distributed energy generation in buildings, building control systems. My third point, and that's the crucial one on one of the key assets cities have, which is to foster the transition through collaboration. It was a big surprise for us to see when we asked about the triggers of green policy that public opinion comes first and then immediately followed uh, by political leadership change. In a way, speaking in the context of this conference, it's a bit like Adam Greenfield coming together with Enrique Peñalosa. And that's a unique energy which cities can exploit. And in addition to that, and that's also something we were able to show through our in-depth analyses, cities are indeed able to very well navigate through engaging a whole range of key stakeholders. And again, community groups and their general public come first. That was probably one of the most important surprises. But all of that is not enough if we really want to accelerate the change. It became absolutely clear that policy frameworks at other levels of government, in particular the national, still matter enormously. And they need to be in sync with what your city tries to achieve. This is Berlin. And Berlin's electric mobility initiative is one of these examples where pioneering is really cutting edge at the very moment. But it's only able to be cutting edge because it's in the broader framework. It sits within that framework of the German energy transition. Without it, it would not work. What's currently happening in Berlin is something I think we should all watch. My final point is about cities as placemakers. The role of spatial planning and infrastructure investment, which is something the urban age has traditionally been emphasizing. A question around the key policy tools that cities use refer to development planning, standards and regulation, and public awareness as the key ones. And all three either directly or indirectly relate to the capacity of making place, of shaping the city physically. And interestingly, when we directly ask the question about the capability cities have and how they would rate them, urban planning comes first. This is something no other tier of government comes even close to in terms of the competences that go with shaping the physical environment. And we all know from the sessions yesterday that shaping the city's physical form, both at the macro, but also at the micro neighborhood level, the architecture of the city is enormously important to deliver the information, to deliver the basis, to deliver also uh, the infrastructures for the activities that then can take place behind it and that ultimately can inform a more sustainable lifestyle and measures of production. Now, in shaping place, there's one tool which we need to emphasize, and it's the importance of infrastructure investments and rolling out infrastructure, such as the example of Copenhagen, where the new metro really informed the development of a new mixed-use corridor, which is currently emerging. It's rail-oriented, it's relatively high density, and it has also produced some rather good architecture in parts of it. Now, this is also a reminder where we can go back to the original electric city, the electric city of the last century, where it was infrastructure that helped deliver a more resilient urban form and fabric. Thank you very much.